So good evening, everyone. My name is Aaron DeLong. Uh, I work for PASA. I'm the Delaware Valley Hub Manager. Uh, and I also uh, do most of our programming related to agroforestry. It's just after seven. We have about half the people registered uh, signed on right now. So I want to give a couple minutes for late arrivals and then and then we'll get going. Thanks. Good evening, everyone. This is Eric. I'll just uh, start to chime in here a little bit. I'm um, glad you're all joining me this evening. I'm glad most people are interested in ginseng. You've come to the right place. <laughs> so that's good. Um, and yeah, it is good to know where everybody's coming from. Um, I am here at Penn State. You have a link here that I just posted to uh, my personal website. Um, at Penn State that will contain a lot of different publications, both research and extension uh, that pertain to forest farming, different plants and especially ginseng. So uh, we only have an hour and about 20 minutes uh, to an hour and a half this evening. And in most years, this one being an exception, although we had one planned, uh, we would spend a full day uh, holding workshops with PASA on ginseng. And we still wouldn't be able to answer all of the questions and entertain all the discussion that comes up. It's a very deep topic. Uh, we're only gonna scratch the surface tonight, but I put together a presentation that will hopefully provide you with a, a good basis for growing ginseng intentionally on your forest land. That's gonna be the, the topic tonight. Uh, and I've also put a link then in um, this chat room here to an article that just came out, I think maybe even today, at least I got it today, uh, that I helped with in the sense that um, I helped the researcher, the, the writer, uh, connect the dots with a lot of the people uh, doing a lot of ginseng farming in the eastern United States and some of the challenges and opportunities that exist. And so you might find it an interesting read. It's pretty well done. Um, and you'll get a pretty good, I think, understanding of kind of the cultural context for uh, ginseng here in the Eastern United States by reading that article. Uh, if you go to my website, you also find contact information. So, you know, we're going to cut this off fairly promptly tonight, um, just in the interest of everybody. It's a Wednesday night. It's been a long week so far. Uh, and so you can always reach out and contact me if you want uh, personally with questions, comments, feedback, etc. cetera. Um, you'll have my email, my contact information there on the website. So. Yeah, so I'll... Eric, just before you get going, uh, I just wanted to, it looks like it's a good time to start now. Um, we're a few past and, um, Folks, uh, if, you if you do have questions, put them in the chat box. At the end of the presentation, um, Gina, my coworker. Is, hmm? will be, is it muted? Please mute. Well, mute I don't yourself. understand. It's kind of. Thank you. Uh, at the end of the presentation, Gina, my coworker, will put a link to a, a event evaluation in the chat string. Please do that. It's very helpful for the presenter and for PASA for future programming. Um, if you're a grower, if you're a farmer, and you're interested in possibly alley cropping on your land, agroforestry practice, um, please contact uh, PASA, contact me, or go to our uh, research webpage, and you'll see an opportunity for farms to fill out an application and be part of an alley cropping project we're running the next two years with NRCS in the state. Wanted to mention to that, that to this audience in particular, uh, might be some farmers with agroforestry uh, aspirations integrated with their annual cropping systems. Um, I think that's it. I uh, just wanted to make sure I kind of got that in before we started. And, um, and again, uh, Dr. Eric Burkhardt is with us tonight. Uh, Dr. Burkhardt is a professional botanist and ethnobotanist. He currently serves as an associate teaching professor at Penn State as well as the Appalachian Botany and Ethnobotany Program Director at Shavers Creek Environmental Center. So thank you so much for being with us tonight, Eric, and, and uh, I'll let you get to it. Okay, good evening, everyone. 
I'll be sharing my screen now. All right. If you're so inclined, you can give me a happy face or a thumbs up if everything's looking good on your screen. Uh, Looks good. All right. Thanks for being here. And uh, what we're going to do is a whirlwind information dump here on you, hopefully in a strategic way, um, and get you thinking about your woods or woods that you might have access to that you can do a little something on. Uh, we're going to talk about a practice called forest farming tonight, and there's a variety of different crops that we can work with. Ginseng is uh, arguably one of the most uh, profitable crops that one can grow on forest lands. Uh, and the approach that we're going to take tonight is to kind of set aside a lot of the, um, the regulate regulations and um, wild stewardship and digging aspects of ginseng and focus a little bit more on forest farming. That is, I'm assuming you're here, or maybe all of you are here, many of you are um, interested in growing it, not necessarily in going out and finding it, although that might be in the back of your head as well. Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the conservation insofar that it is pertinent to why we want to grow this plant at this point. It's both an economic opportunity, but it's a, it's a conservation imperative as well, if you are seriously interested in making money out of the woods, uh, especially with ginseng. And so we'll talk about opportunities and we'll talk about challenges. And I think you're going to see that there's a lot of challenges here. Uh, and it's something that drives a lot of people away from taking this crop on uh, because, you know, everybody would be doing it, right? We'd have ginseng growing just about everywhere. Uh, but as we'll walk through tonight, um, while there's a tremendous amount of opportunities and it's not particularly intensive nor complicated to do, uh, there are a variety of different challenges that one can face between the time of planting and the time of harvest. And so uh, a big section of this presentation is going to be dedicated to when the crop is in the ground, how do you manage it? So let's just start with some uh, visual. If you've never seen American ginseng, um, it is not the most striking plant, perhaps when it has fruit on it, as you see here or when it's turning yellow in the fall is the time when you can see it uh, easily and it may catch your eye as something that's aesthetically pleasing. Otherwise, it's a um, pretty pedestrian kind of understory plant that just uh, blends into the background a lot of the time. Uh, it used to be, as we'll talk about, much more common. And these days, because of its uh, arguable over harvesting, you often find it scattered and that helps to hide it as well. Individual plants rather than large populations are often what one encounters. And the reason that ginseng is so popular, uh, we'll again have to set aside what's it good for, for the most part, and does it work, and how do you make medicine out of it, that's a whole nother presentation, but um, we do want to at least touch on what, it's, what it is. Uh, it is a medicinal plant more than anything. Uh, some, some people argue uh, it's got no more medicinal value than a carrot, and that could be, I guess, argued. Um, but there are some really interesting uh, chemicals that are found in this particular plant and genus that are fairly unique and fairly complicated. And we barely scratched the surface of understanding how they all interact within um, mammals and humans. And as a result, you know, many of you probably have heard that ginseng is useful for a variety of different conditions. And I've got a bunch listed here. Uh, and some of them may be simply, you know, having to do with libido and others may be a little bit more serious, such as right now in the time of COVID with bo boosting your immune function and things of that nature. Uh, so there are a variety of these things called ginsenicides that are found in the plant. Um, and these things number in the at least over 100 right now, very complex uh, chemistry in this plant, and they do have a very broad activity in the body. And that makes it very difficult to use kind of a classic reductionist scientific model to, to understand what this plant does, because it does a lot of stuff simultaneously. Uh, so it's something that if you're consuming high quality ginseng over a period of time, 
Uh, it tends overall to support the body and is referred to as an adaptogen or something that helps the body to adapt to stress, both internal and external. Now, ginseng, true ginsengs belong to a genus called Panax. So in the scientific realm and literature, we refer to plants not just by their common names, but their scientific names as well. And that scientific name typically has two parts. We'll be talking about Panax quinquefolius, which is the genus and species. Uh, and it's important to recognize that that's one of nine species that are found in the world. And much of the value that surrounds in the knowledge that surrounds ginseng actually is derived from the high value that's placed on it on the other side of the planet. So of course, the transfer of things from China to the United States has become quite a topic of conversation in the last you know, 10 months. Uh, but this exchange has been going on for a long time. And in fact, many of our invasive species such as spotted lanternfly, emerald ash borer, are from that part of the world. And so we're talking about temperate deciduous forests, both in Eastern Asia and then in Eastern North America that are of the same latitude and as a result have a very similar species composition. It's believed that in the past, there was maybe a connection between the continents up by where Alaska is now in Beringia, which is underwater right now, but a, an underwater mountain chain that was once exposed. And that's maybe how uh, the species got to be in these two parts of the world. Other people suggest that people may have moved it from Asia over to North America with migration um, a long time ago. Nonetheless, we have two species here in Eastern North America. We're gonna talk about American ginseng Panax quinquefolius tonight. There is dwarf ginseng Panax trifolius, which we will not talk about tonight, which is also found here in the Eastern United States. This is a very small species. It's a true spring ephemeral. It pops up in April and is gone by the time we hit Memorial Day weekend. Uh, it does have ginsenicides in it, but it is of no commercial value at this time. Uh, so if you're interested in finding or using ginseng uh, yourself, that is an analog that is a possibility on your property. Uh, the other thing I want to say before moving on is that these nine species over in China, one of them known as Panax ginseng is the most revered of the genus Panax. This is the one that goes back into history. Uh, 3,000 plus years into China. At this point in history, it is nearly extirpated. Uh, there are only a few populations that remain and they are located in adjacent Russia and are protected. Uh, so that species uh, gives us a cautionary tale potentially of where we're heading if we don't start to turn this situation around that I'm going to be describing with American ginseng shortly. So American ginseng is widely cultivated and it's grown in three major parts of the world. Uh, one of them in the United States is Wisconsin. The second is just across uh, the lake from us in Ontario. Uh, that's where this picture was taken. And then of course, over in the Orient in places like China and South Korea, they're growing American ginseng. American ginseng, as we'll talk about, is a shade obligate plant. It doesn't just tolerate the shade, but it requires the shade. And so what you see here, a shade cloth of approximately 70% shade. And that ginseng crop there is basically being grown in a time frame of about three to four years using all of the latest technology, which includes and requires uh, heavy intensive inputs such as pesticides. Uh, American ginseng, as we'll talk about when grown under these types of conditions, is subject to a variety of fungal diseases that will wipe it out very quickly within a period of three to five years. Um, and so that puts a check on everybody's uh, dreams of gold and, and retirement, early retirement, because you do have to realize there's a balance that you have to strike with this particular crop if you're going to avoid using things like fungicides. So this crop looks big and beautiful uh, because it is uh, requiring a whole lot of input in terms of the technology uh, and the equipment that's used to produce this kind of thing.
But this is what has saved ginseng essentially, because this began about a hundred years ago with wooden over um, uh, shade cloth slats, if you will. And uh, that basically led to the development of a cultivated industry that has by and large been used to develop products that most Americans would consume these days. Uh, very few of us in the United States and Canada consume the kind of product that we're going to be focused in on tonight, which is a wild simulated type of product grown under forested conditions to mimic the forest such that we get a very natural and some might say a more healthful product. Okay? And so this is something that uh, is a, you know, a, a great achievement in conservation and cultivation, but it does have uh, some drawbacks to it. Now, that type of product is represented on the right side of this visual here. Uh, American ginseng is sold by and large, although this is changing a little bit, but by and large by its aesthetics, what it looks like. Uh, and the wilder the characteristics, the more appeal it has within the Chinese market. Now, there's a whole lot of conversation we could have about that, and there's a whole lot of dismissal that many Americans and Westerners would place on that concept. But what I would suggest to you is just the simple premise that uh, energy matters too, right? And what we mean is in Chinese medicine, traditional Chinese medicine, it's not just the chemical constituents that might be in a plant, for example, or the nutritional composition of it, but it's the energy that also animates it. If we think about ourselves, it's akin to what we would describe as the soul, right? We, we, kind of all think and hope that we're more than just a lump of clay, right? So same thing is true. In traditional Chinese medicine, there is a lot of uh, credence given to the fact that these plants reflect where they are grown. And the one on the left here represents uh, a wild type ginseng root. And you'll notice that oftentimes these are quite small relative to cultivated roots. If you look at the ruler scale there, and you'll also notice that off the top of that root on the left side, you have this thin wiry little thing that goes up. In the middle, we have just a short stumpy one. And then on the right, there's barely anything there. That's known as a neck. And the longer that neck is, the longer that plant has been growing, the older it is. Uh, and in traditional Chinese medicine, plants that uh, are able to grow for a long time in their native habitat without pesticides, without fertilizers, and which are allowed to absorb the energy of their surroundings uh, have more inherent value as a healing um, property, right? Uh, and so that's a very simplistic way to think about it, but nevertheless, it holds a lot of um, you know, parallels, I guess, with a lot of modern contemporary physics and so on. It's very interesting to think about that aspect of plant medicine. Um, and because the Chinese do think about it that way, they are willing to pay even now uh, large amounts of dollars for that type of a product. Cultivated ginseng on the right side, you can see the price is typically anywhere from five to $30. Right now, because of the tariff wars that are in place with China, ginseng has been targeted from Canada and from Wisconsin, and they can't give it away. Uh, it's a really sad situation for a lot of those growers, like I just showed you the picture from. Uh, but on the left side, on the other hand, we have our forest growers, and they've been virtually unhurt uh, during this situation because there's always a demand and has been for more than 100 years and in fact, as we'll talk about for almost 300 years for a high quality wild product. And so the price oftentimes, depending on how wild it looks and how old it is, can range at around $1,000 or more these days. Sometimes people use cultivation methods in the forest, and we're going to get into some of this as we walk along here in a moment. Uh, and in the middle is what you see represented. That's called a woods cultivated root. It has characteristics of both wild and cultivated plants. And as a result, depending on the buyer, uh, it's priced intermediate to that. So you can get sometimes an overlapping price with wild prices and sometimes it's more of a cultivated price. Okay, there is no shortage of demand uh, for ginseng in the state of Pennsylvania, nor in the eastern United States. In fact, we can't produce enough of it. 
And that's an important thing to keep in mind. Um, ginseng is bought and sold by a network of root buyers, ginseng dealers, as they're referred to. They're typically licensed from all states. And they will often put out signs, for example, like this one from Shane Trout in Northern Pennsylvania. Uh, they'll advertise these days very widely on platforms like Facebook. And when you start to compare prices over time, um, one of the things that you'll notice is that the average price paid for what are wild appearing roots continue to go up while the price for cultivated roots continues to stay about the same. Uh, cultivated roots are managed much in the way that corn or soybeans would be. Uh, for example, I mentioned the, the trade war that's happening right now and the tariffs that have been imposed on ginseng exports that has basically idled uh, the planting up there. And so they're going out of acreage, right? They're taking land out of acreage and putting it in cover crops and that sort of stuff right now and hope that in a couple of years, uh, the market will come back and the prices will go up because there's none available. So there's a boom and bust that happens with ginseng uh, and you see it readily in the wild markets. Uh, where there's a lot of speculation in a particular year. If you look at 2007, for example, there's a peak there of about $500. And then in 2009 or so, it's down to about $300. Uh, and these days, we're somewhere in the range of about $600 to $800 on average for high quality root, 10 years or more. Um, but depending on, you know, different characteristics of it that we don't have time to really delve into tonight, such as the shape, so on, uh, you can get much more than that, uh, sometimes as much as a thousand to fifteen hundred dollars. Um, that has to be a really premium crop, okay? But a really premium crop oftentimes just results from picking out a good forest land, sowing some seeds, and using patience. The trade in American ginseng began in the early 1700s. It began, remember that I said that uh, there are nine species of Panax, one of which is called Panax ginseng, has thousands of years of history over in China. Well, that plant was described and illustrated, as you can see here, and sent through a variety of letters through Jesuit missionaries uh, in correspondences and ended up amongst a Jesuit missionary who was stationed in what we would call now Ontario, Canada, uh, and was up there um, uh, preaching, if you will, colonizing the Native Americans and recognized that there was a similarity in the flora between uh, Eastern North America and what was being described and documented in China, uh, which I had referenced earlier. And so started to describe this plant and said, you know, the Chinese just can't get enough of this stuff. Uh, I bet if this thing exists in the new world um, that they'll buy as much as they can get. Uh, and so that was 1713. Uh, by about 1730 or so in Pennsylvania, we were already looking into cultivation of ginseng because the trade had developed to such an extent that it was starting to boom. And so if we rewind only about 120 years, uh, we get to publications by the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, the PDA, on the cultivation of ginseng in the Pennsylvania. Uh, the first horticulturalist at uh, Penn State University was a gentleman by the name of George Butts. And George Butts, in writing the preface to this uh, early extension publication, which he was asked to write, um, on ginseng cultivation, including on forest lands, by the way. This is not some like new, uh, you know, university fangled concept. People have been growing things on forest lands for a long time. Uh, but he lamented the fact that people were collecting ginseng in the state in a way that was clearly unsustainable. Uh, this had been documented even 100 years prior to George Butts' time. And the fact that people were taking plants in particular, everything that they could find, uh, without allowing any of the seeds to mature, without planting any seeds, um, basically was just driving the extinction of the plant in these localities that were still forested. And then we add in all of the changes that were being wrought because of uh, settlement of the landscape and cutting of forests and grazing on forest lands and all those sorts of things. And we realized that uh, there was a, a real conservation concern even 120 plus years ago 
about what the future of American ginseng was going to be in Pennsylvania. And so the good news is that just as with then, uh, we have this opportunity to step in and um, look at this as a crop and try and fill the demand that won't go away okay, uh, by Chinese and Korean consumers and utilize forest lands uh, in ways that maybe we hadn't thought about before. Uh, this is a broadly speaking a practice referred to as agroforestry, where we're thinking about how trees can be used within cropping scenarios to produce desirable crops, including sometimes livestock. Okay. And in achieving agroforestry, we can often achieve different conservation goals as well, because you know we can, in this case, at the very least, conserve forest land, right? So some of us enjoy our forest land, don't necessarily want to cut the trees, uh, maybe just want to thin them every now and then, that sort of thing. And so this is a way that we can actually grow things on forest lands and we can potentially uh, get some annual income or semi-annual income to pay for things like taxes and so on. And within agroforestry in the United States, we have five recognized practices. Aaron mentioned one of them. Uh, it's referred to as alley cropping. Uh, but we also have things maybe you've heard of like wind breaks and uh, forest buffers, okay, silva pasture systems. Uh, forest farming is one of those five agroforestry practices that is promoted at the federal level. Uh, we do have a national agroforestry center. So if you want to Google that, you'll find that we have a agroforestry extension center located in all places out of Nebraska. But that's because it was founded during the Dust Bowl era for the revegetation of the Great Plains with windbreaks and other types of tree crops. So um, the forest farming practice is a practice where unlike most of those other practices, we start with an existing crop of trees and we think about what we're going to do underneath that canopy to grow a crop. Uh, the other four practices by and large start with a crop that we're going to try and integrate a tree crop into, right? So we're gonna try and think about how do we get trees into this field in a strategic way or into this pasture. Okay. And so we're kind of taking the reverse approach here with forest farming. Now, the picture I have up here is uh, definitely what might be evoked when you think about forest farming, right? The name suggests that it's this very intensive practice where we're going to go into the understory. We're going to heavily manipulate the understory like we would a garden or a farm field. We're going to plant these things in there in nice little rows, as you can see there. And we're going to cultivate them as if they're carrots in the woods. And in fact, we can do that with some plants. But more often than not, forest farming is practiced in a way that is much more complex and less tidy and OCD than that. And so a lot of what we're going to walk through in the remainder of the presentation is going to be devoted to thinking about different approaches to forest farming, depending on how intensively you want to do it. Now, there are a variety of uh, advantages and challenges associated. I'm going to hit on these as we walk through them, but I just wanted to put these up just to get you thinking about it. Um, one of the big ones with ginseng, as we'll end on, is some crops are attractive to poachers. So some people maybe don't even think of themselves as poachers. They just think of themselves as wild crafters or, or uh, you know, foragers. But nonetheless, they come onto your property and they forage your crop. Uh, and so it's still the same effect, right? Um, and that is a challenge and it can be a problem. Uh, but there's a lot of advantages uh, associated with this. And we're gonna take a kind of ginseng centric approach to talking about some of those advantages we walk through the slides here. The first thing we wanna realize is that ginseng is not a dandelion, okay? This is a weed of sorts, meaning that it grows itself pretty happily on forest lands if it's the right type of forest land and you don't really need to fuss with it too much. In fact, most people have problems when they try and fuss with it too much. But by it's not a weed or a dandelion, I mean, uh, this is a plant that will take many years to mature. It's not something you plant in the springtime and then you come back in August and harvest it. This is gonna be a crop that you're gonna wait at least five years for. And most buyers uh, only pay good prices when you're up above 10 years. That may seem like a long time, 
Uh, it is a long time, okay? But it goes very quickly. Uh, that's the nature of life. I've already got ginseng patches that are 25 years old. And if I would have never planted those seeds because I thought, I don't know if I'll even be interested in ginseng in 25 years, you know, I wouldn't have them. Uh, you just plant and you tend it. And next thing you know, it's like, wow, 10 years. I can't believe where that went. And there it is. Um, and it's there for you to manage and harvest. And from then on, it's not like a typical crop where you need to harvest it all. You can kind of thin it and you can replant it and it can become more of a cyclical crop rather than a linear crop that you can harvest from periodically if you, if you don't clean it out. Um, so it's not like a dandelion. It's not an easy and um, kind of impatient crop for people, but uh, it is a little bit straightforward as we're going to talk about in terms of uh, how to grow it. The first thing that you need to recognize as to why it's not a dandelion is that, as I said, the time horizon is a long one. And in that time horizon, you have to learn to recognize the different stages of the plant. So because of the limitation of time tonight, I've kind of cut out, you know, a bunch of slides that I often walk people through to identify all the plants. At this point, you know, you can pretty much Google ginseng and you can find lots of stuff or follow some Facebook sites or that sort of stuff and you'll see lots of pictures. What I want to give you a sense of is just how this plant grows and what that means for forest farming. This is a plant that goes through at least uh, four different stages, sometimes more than that. Um, especially when it's grown on forest lands. What I've got here is on the upper end, on the 12 o'clock end, is a slower growth pattern. And on a six o'clock end of things is a slightly more rapid pattern. And you'll notice that in the slightly more rapid pattern, we have this stage called a one prong stage that's missing. Okay, so you may have additional stages that pop in between these kind of clear stages that I'm illustrating here, depending on the site conditions. The plants under the most ideal conditions, such as those artificial shade gardens I just showed you from Ontario, those plants are grown in a period of three or four years. And so the bottom chart would be followed, right? Or progression would be followed. You'd have a seedling come up and then you'd have a two prong and then a three prong and a four prong in year four. But in the wild and in forest farming, that progression, while it's predictable, takes a much longer time and pathway. And so the pathway between a seedling and a four pronger on a forest land might be 10 to 15 years. Okay. But as we said, that patience does pay for itself in the price. And so there is a little bit of a you know, cost and benefit even with the pricing when we think about you know, how much money you can make. And we'll think about that a little bit more carefully in a moment. Um, so what this plant looks like when you're looking down at the ground is what you're seeing here as a visual. Each leaf is composed of numerous leaflets. And here we have on average five leaflets, which is typical. And those leaves look like a Virginia creeper or horse chestnut or a tree of that nature or a vine of that nature, if you're familiar with those. Okay. They're ar arranged around a central stalk, which is in the center of those leaves and goes down to the ground. And that's where the root is. And in the center of those leaves is also then where we're going to see the flowers and fruit when the plants become reproductive. Now, let's talk a little bit about uh, profitability. I realize a lot of people may be tuning into this just because they're interested in maybe growing themselves a little patch, something like that. And, you know, take this with a grain of salt then. But there's also folks out there that really want to get busy with ginseng farming. And in fact, ginseng farming is something that is catching on. Uh, and I work with ginseng farmers here in Pennsylvania. In fact, we were going to hold a, a ginseng workshop, Pasa and myself, with some ginseng farmers over near Brookville this year that we had to cancel. Uh, but there are some ginseng farmers uh, out there that grow on forest lands. And we worked with them to really kind of look at the, the economics behind a variety of different forest botanicals with uh, pretty deep demands. Um, and so we looked at ginseng, of course, but other things like golden seal and so on were included in here, uh, basically eight different species. One of the things that we found is that with everything except for, in some cases, golden seal, and in every case, ginseng, 
uh, you had to be really, really careful about the investment because if you even invested in planting stock, oftentimes you were going to lose money off of the proposition. And this is a whole other uh, talk and effort that we're working on is to bring the price for some of these other forest botanicals up. But right now, because of wild crafting, they're artificially deflated. Uh, and while they're every bit as difficult to grow as uh, ginseng is, difficult in the sense of the time and patience requirement, um, they are unfortunately much more undervalued. So whereas ginseng is seven or $800, a plant like say black cohosh is worth four or $5, okay? So a lot of these other plants are highly undervalued. And at this time, we only recommend a lot of caution if you're interested in growing them. But the two that do pop out are golden seal under some circumstances, especially with the prices up as they are right now, and ginseng. And so let me just lay it out for you and hopefully as straight away as I can. And I promise this is the only real graph that I've got in here tonight, all right? So this is a financial analysis we did. Um, it's called an enterprise budget is what this thing is. And we worked with growers to figure out a variety of scenarios when you're growing ginseng on forest lands from seed or transplants, okay, the green or yellow. Um, and you had a, a variety of different parameters that you change in those growing scenarios. What would be the break even price that you would need to get per pound to make some money at this? Okay, and a lot of this break even price I'll just mention is influenced by time because your time just waiting for 10 years is an opportunity cost as we would say in economics, okay. So uh, a big thing that you see here is on the left are historic prices and those are adjusted for inv inflation. And this was a, uh, you know, put together about 10 years ago. So the price at that point was about $600 a pound on average, okay. And so $600 maximum price on average, minimum 250, average price close to $400 uh, is, a, is what ginseng has been going for. And when you compare production on forest lands from seed or transplants under a variety of scenarios, you'll notice that all of those bars are below those bars on the left, which means that the price that you need per pound represented there, they're all below uh, the prices that are being paid in the marketplace, okay? And so what are those scenarios? If you can hasten the plants up to four or six years, uh, assuming that they look wild and look good, you can basically get some advantage out of that, right? Uh, but if you could actually do that a little bit earlier, so uh, on the left side, let's just look at the green. Six years would be your horizon from seed minimum before you could harvest your ginseng. But if you were to like, let's say, work the soil up a little bit and had a really ideal site and the plants were growing a little bit faster and lo and behold, after four years, you could harvest them, that would be your break even cost. Okay, if you didn't have to pay for the seed, you didn't have to pay for any planting stock, um, that's the NSC. If you didn't have any annual costs, which is what we're gonna talk about tonight, which is basically wild simulated production. Um, basically, that's the biggest thing, right, is, 10 years of taking on a crop is a big effort. But if you can grow something just by putting the seed out there and maybe fiddling with it for a few hours each year and then go back and harvest it, well, that takes a lot of the cost of production out. And so basically we're looking at somewhere around $50 mark from seed as a cost of production for your time. And the profit here can be as high as, well, these days, six, 700 or more dollars. Um, so basically ginseng is a profitable beast if you can grow it and you can keep people from stealing it, okay? Uh, you can make a lot of money at it. And so accepting that premise, we now know that there's a lot of people who are interested in growing ginseng and a lot of them are planting ginseng on their forest lands, even if they're not calling it forest farming. They're still putting it out there because it is clearly something that if you do it right, you don't need to invest a lot up front, uh, and you can have a pretty good return. But I do want to make you think about the fact that even if we're talking about thousand dollars a pound, it takes about two hundred roots to make a pound of dry ginseng, and you're looking at a minimum of five years per crop. Five dollars per plant or root or $1 per year is what you're getting for each of those plants. 
So in other words, you want to think about it a little bit like a nursery operator would. You're holding these plants in the ground year in, year out, and each and every one of those costs you're thinking about. And so while $1,000 might seem like a lot, it really is just basically a fair price for your effort, for all of the risk involved with planting these things and babysitting them for a long time. And so while people may balk at this idea of paying $1,000 for this crop, um, and you may drool over the idea of getting paid $1,000 per pound for this crop, uh, successful growers realize that there's a lot of time, patience, risk, and reward that's involved with this particular crop. And part of that is driven by the fact that when you grow it on forest lands, your yields are gonna be on the low end. This is a forest farmer that I worked with we took his uh, wild simulated crop, 10 to 14 years old, uh, harvested 4,000 roots, about 18 and a half pounds, weighed each and every one of those roots out dry. And you'll notice that most of the roots, uh, even after 10 years, come out somewhere around one to two grams, which is not a lot, right? There's about 454 uh, or so grams in a pound. So it takes a lot of roots to make a pound and it takes a lot of time to make a lot of roots. Versus in those uh, fields that I showed you earlier, artificial shade, they were looking at after four years, they can typically dig anywhere from 2,500 to 6,500 pounds an acre. So the reason why that type of cultivation makes sense for them, as long as there's not tariffs in place, is the fact that when you grow it that quickly and you get the yields that they get, you can compensate for the difference in the price between a cultivated and a wild plant, for example. Now, the thing that they have to deal with, though, is they've got to put all that infrastructure up and they've got to do all of that crop intensive management, right, with fungicides and all that sort of stuff. And so the cost of that type of production, my Canadian friend growers tell me, can be oftentimes as much as about $35,000 an acre for all that shade and apparatus and equipment and so on. Uh, the benefit then that we get here in Appalachia is that this is a native Appalachian forest plant and we can just use the forest canopy instead of paying for all of that structure. And as this being a shade obligate plant, as I referred to earlier, uh, it not just is a, a, a cost savings, but it basically makes sense for us to be growing this plant in Appalachia. And furthermore, we stack in this idea that as we're going to talk about when we grow ginseng, we often don't necessarily want to grow it as a monoculture like they do in these fields where they have to spray fungicides. But it often grows in with other valuable forest crops, things like golden seal and black cohosh, that these are crops that we can also simultaneously grow as what are uh, oftentimes referred to as polycultural scenarios, right? Where we've got plants mixed together in the forest understory. And so this can be in beds or it can be just be scattered around. It can be a mixture of things that you've planted in the area versus things that are already growing there that you're just managing for or maybe planting seeds. Okay? And so the sky's the limit in terms of how these things can fit together. And we, we look to nature really to tell us what fits together. So in that regard, when we're thinking about growing ginseng or any of the companion crops to ginseng, we're looking for so-called indicator species for where to grow these things, right? So for ginseng, we're looking for things like sugar maple, tulip poplar, basswood, ash trees as overstory plants. In the understory, we might be looking for plants like golden seal and black cohosh. So these, um, arrangements of plants and how they occur in the landscape are going to be what we want to learn to recognize and pay attention to. And furthermore, uh, when we find them and learn from them, we don't necessarily want to say, okay, well, golden seal's growing here. Let me just kind of get rid of that so I can plant more ginseng. But we want to manage them as crops simultaneously. Uh, golden seal itself has a high value. And as it turns out, for reasons that science can explain, and most people can't explain either, um, as we grow these crops in more polycultural scenarios, that is with more diverse understory composition, we often find that we have less problems with things like disease and predation from voles and, and other types of critters. And so then when we get through that, we just think about, well, how do I wanna do it? 
how do I want to approach this forest farming proposition, assuming I've got the right woods? Okay. And there's a continuum of what I call plant husbandry options. Yes, that's a little bit academic, but it best describes what we're talking about here. On the left side, we have just being a wild steward. Let's say you've got ginseng on your property already. Um, and so it's just a matter of figuring out and learning how to best be a steward of that ginseng there, planting the seeds and protecting it from predation and all that sort of thing. Okay. On the other end of the spectrum is maybe I want to go really intensive. I want to go big. I got flat land. Uh, I can get a little rototiller in there. I can work the dirt up a little bit. Uh, pardon me, soil for the soil scientists out there. And then I can plant those roots out there and maybe hasten them along. Uh, in the middle is where most people are at. And that's what I'm going to kind of demonstrate to you tonight, which is this kind of idea of wild simulated, right? What is that? That's, well, we're just growing it like it's wild essentially, but we're being very intentional about where we're planting it, what we're planting it with, how we're managing it. Much more intentional, let's say, than just going out and foraging for it. Okay, and so it really all just starts with a couple of mountain goats like these guys, um, just getting to know your forest or forest lands around you, seeing what grows there, what grows with one another, learning uh, through publications such as the extension publications you can obtain on my website, uh, which companion plants you wanna be looking for and that sort of thing. Get out there, start to look around and start to think about what you wanna do. And the easiest place to start is just to start seeding things, right? what we would call the Johnny ginsengs rather than the Johnny apple seeds. Um, and many people do this. I refer to the commons here because people even do this on public lands. Uh, they'll take ginseng seeds out on state park lands or state forest lands or state game lands and just plant them there. Um, and they do it because it's a native plant and they don't feel any uh, ethical boundaries or, or mor morality around that, you know, um, and we could argue whether they should be doing it or not, but it happens all the time. People move seeds and plant material around. Um, but oftentimes people are doing this on their own property where they can protect it, they can look at it, they can manage it, and they start by taking some seed or gathering some seed from existing plants in their forest and looking for good locations that are also found on their property or property they have access to legally um, and maybe enhancing those locations if there's already plants there or starting new populations in those locations. Okay, And so there's a little bit of trial and error there. You definitely don't want to put all your eggs in one basket. That frequently happens when people plant ginseng. They're like, this is perfect. This meets all the descriptions that Dr. Burkhart mentioned in his publication. I'm going to put the whole pound right here. Uh, and then they're like, oh, I, I got a few seeds left in my pocket on the way out of the woods. And they're like, I'll just drop them in here. Well, maybe that almost full pound fails, but those few seeds actually work. That's typically how it works, right? A little bit bit of a Murphy's Law or something going on there. But nonetheless, you want to think about different locations that look good or promising for moving plants into. And so it all begins with efficiency around seeding, right? There's a lot of different ways that seeds can get into the soil. Um, and people who plant ginseng each and every year, as many people, myself included, do, realize that it can be backbreaking work. And so let me just pause there and say, if you haven't already figured it out yet, you're going to realize that growing ginseng is not the most easiest proposition, including physically, okay? There's a lot of bending over and digging roots. You know, if you like digging carrots in the garden, then you're maybe halfway to this point of maybe enjoying ginseng digging in the woods because in the woods, you've got roots and rocks and all kinds of impediments to getting those things out of the ground. And so it can take, literally, it's taken me 15 or 20 minutes to dig a single root out of a particular area. Um, so it's a lot of work and you have to like working in the woods, okay? If you don't, um, this may not be for you. But there are efficiencies to be found. And one of those is just how do you get the seeds into the ground? On the left side, you can buy these uh, old kind of um, conservation planters. These things are very heavy, bulky. They really don't help much in the end. Uh, they often drop too many seeds in the hole. 
and they pay they weigh about 50 or 60 pounds in some cases on the right side is the so-called patented seed stick with i think johnny select seeds maybe still sells that's what this came from and that's maybe a, a slightly better improvement but what often happens with these types of uh, poke and jab kinds of uh, implements as they're called is that the little poker hole in the bottom that the seed comes out will get gummed up even though it's not supposed to uh, in the seed stick, for example, they claim that it's never supposed to get blocked up. And it may never get blocked up in a typical garden or agronomic situation, but when you're in a silty loam soil in the forest, it does get blocked up. And it's a constant putting your finger up in there to dig the dirt out. And sometimes you just wonder, why don't I just plant the seeds with my hand, right? This is my preferred method. Uh, just take a little bucket, uh, favorite beverage, and a little bit of... Uh, uh, a hammock or a mattock or something of that nature out into the woods and I just dig them in and I make sure that the seeds are getting in contact with the mineral soil which is the most important thing. So uh, when do you plant ginseng? Let's just talk about this. I'm going to talk more about seed uh, and how you, how you grow ginseng in a moment but when is right now uh, and there still is seed available out there uh, although it's getting on the back end of the season for sale but essentially you're waiting for sometime in the fall uh, when the moisture and the leaves are coming down on the forest floor. Uh, that's the time when you wanna get out there and you wanna hopefully have your location all, already picked out. But at any rate, you wanna put those seeds in, you wanna move away the duff. And there's a variety of ways to do that okay, with rakes and some people use leaf blowers. Uh, like I said, I tend to just be favored with a little mattock uh, and just take my time with it. But you can, again, make up all kinds of efficiencies and learn about them from the web and videos on YouTube and so on. But the timing is important. You'll recall that it's been quite dry in Pennsylvania, at least in most of the state, maybe not in Southeastern PA. Um, and in most of Pennsylvania then, we didn't have uh, appreciable rain between let's say mid June and the beginning of September. And we really just started to get some ground soaking with the hurricane last week and so on. So oftentimes you have to wait until the ground is thoroughly soaked and you've got an insulating layer there because the number one thing that causes ginseng planters to fail, assuming they've picked out a decent site, is the fact that the seed dries out. If the seed dries out in ginseng, you'll notice that that seed in the bucket there is slightly shiny because it's got moisture on it. You don't want it to be wet because it'll rot, but it's typically bought and sold in moist little uh, bags, right? Maybe a little piece of moss in it or something like that. If it's sold to you dry, uh, you've been scammed and you need to send it back, all right? But uh, seed needs to remain moist and viable. So whether you're planting seeds back from plants that are on your property or you're buying seed in, you're waiting for the soil to be properly moistened. You're waiting for the duff to kind of build that fresh layer of leaves like we're getting right now and then you're gonna put it in. Now, the later that you can put it in, the better, in my opinion. It just depends on how much you're planting. Some people have to start planting in August because it's gonna take them, if they do it on the weekends, for example, two months to get all their seed in. Okay? But I prefer to wait till latest I can in the season because uh, we start to get into a situation this time of year where lots of things are trying to fatten up, right, for winter. And that includes things like turkeys and chipmunks and, and mice, and they will voraciously eat these seeds. It'll be like you're just planting a patch of grass seed for these things to come in and scratch out. So the longer you can wait to get that seed in until these things start to settle down, let's say, and the acorn crops are on the ground and attract the turkey's attention and all that sort of stuff, um, I think the better, right? So keep that in mind. Uh, but now is typically when we plant in the fall. The seed comes from all kinds of places, but let me just tell you, it's all coming from one of two places, Wisconsin or Ontario, Canada. It may be coming from Shane Trout. It may be coming from Billy Taylor, but they're all getting it from the same place. And that's because ginseng seed in the wild uh, ginseng plants don't produce much in the way of seed, with few exceptions. Sometimes you have really good seed bearing plants and you, you generally want to keep those in the population and not harvest them. But oftentimes because of the vagaries of the growing season and 
all of the things that you know um, come into uh, the stress realm of ginseng's growing environment during the summer months, you oftentimes don't get the seed output that you would in cultivated scenarios like those Ontario gardens. And so they sell the seed as a byproduct of that type of production out of those big shade gardens. Now, uh, that makes for seed that is widely available uh, and mostly affordable. This year, the seed was extremely affordable, uh, down to $25 a pound in many areas. And a pound, as you can see, is somewhere around the 7,000 7, seeds to the pound. Uh, so this seed is available. You'll find people selling it if you Google it on the internet. Uh, many dealers that buy ginseng sell seed. Uh, many people that are on social media in these ginseng groups sell seed. And that's probably where a lot of people start with getting their seed. What I will say is that once you find a good source of seed, and hopefully they've been in business for a while, um, you stick with them because they're generally going to have a relationship with these shade producers where they know what the quality of the seed is because you, you just never can be sure exactly what the quality is going to be. You're buying it from you know, the Midwest or from Canada and it should all be viable and there should be a lot of high quality stratified seed in there, but uh, you just don't know. And so when you find a good person, you kind of stick with them if you can. <coughs> and that will help ensure that you've got, you know, at least some high quality seed. Now, beyond that, you might be saying to yourself, well, I'm in Maryland, I'm in Pennsylvania, I'm in Kentucky. I don't necessarily want to plant Canadian seed on my property. Um, I'd like something a little closer to home. Well, as it turns out, just about every source of seed, as he said, when you scratch below the surface uh, and you push the people on where they're getting the seed from, it's all coming from essentially two places. It's Wisconsin or it's Ontario, Canada. Uh, and so while it may be sold from Ohio, from Kentucky, from West Virginia, it's coming from those types of shade gardens. So what does that mean? It means that right now there is a genetic bottleneck going on in ginseng. It's probably been going on for some time now, ever since the interest in cultivation of ginseng has started. And for those who aren't familiar with this, it's basically a genetic bottleneck is exactly what I've illustrated here. So when you've got a whole lot of genetic diversity initially in a crop or in a species, but something whittles it down such that there's very little genetic diversity left. And at this point, American ginseng, which only occurs in Eastern North America, has been either entirely harvested out of large regions, or there are fragmented small wild populations left, or there are some people that are managing fairly nice large wild populations on their property and they're not giving away seed. Okay or you have to buy this type of cultivated seed, which has essentially been selected for and continues to be selected for growing conditions, which are largely different than forested understory conditions. So what does this mean? Right now, it's a theoretical concern for most of us. There's, it's very difficult to kind of say, well, you shouldn't plant this seed, but many people want to plant local seed and yet they can't find it. So what's sorely needed at this point is for people to, before they start planting ginseng seed, start to take stock of what's already growing on their property and start managing for whatever's on their property because that's going to be the most locally adapted. If they don't have any ginseng on their property, then there's really nothing to lose. Uh, get whatever seeds that you can and make it a high quality seed and put it out there. Now, the good news is this has only gone through 100 years of selection under those artificial shade conditions. And what that means is it's still American ginseng. It's not like it's a different species. And it's pretty similar uh, genetically to um, you know, cultivated seed to the wild stock, but there are some differences. But it does point to the fact that um, that seed is being grown and selected for under very different conditions than what you have on your forest land wherever you're at. And if you get a batch of seed and you fail miserably and all the conditions looked perfect, uh, it very well may, may be that the batch of seed that you got just 
did not have the genetics in it that were going to be successful on your property. And so you may try something different, you know, a different grower uh, in Canada instead of Wisconsin or something like that. Okay. So it's a little bit of a challenge right now to find a good source of seed. And that's all a way of saying that it's out there commercially. You should try and obtain a high quality source, meaning it's uh, viable, it's clean, it doesn't have disease on it. Um, it's got a lot of, uh, you know, good reputation, person's been in business, all that sort of stuff. It's at a good price, more than anything. Um, and not get too hung up on where it's coming from if you don't have any ginseng on your property to begin with. But if you have ginseng on your property, you do want to think about what you can do to promote the growth of that local crop, that heirloom crop, if you will. And if you're bringing in some of this Canadian stock or Wisconsin stock, you want to keep that segregated. Keep it in a different hollow or in a different part of your property okay, so that you don't get that crossing inadvertently because we just don't know what the consequences are right now. Could be beneficial, but it also could swamp out the remaining genetic stock. Yeah, and so you get into this situation. I saw this, remember some of you maybe remember maybe two months ago, there were all these mysterious Chinese seeds being shipped to post, post office boxes around the Eastern United States, right? And people were opening up and they were saying, I don't know what this seed is, should I plant it? Right. So this is a little cartoon that someone put out around that time. Like, I don't know, should I should I plant this thing? It might, you know, be this crazy little invasive species that germinates. Uh, and so a lot of people are having a similar sort of consternation over ginseng stock right now because it is a native species and it is emerging crop as to what do I do? Where do I start? What, what sh is it bad for me to plant commercial stuff? And just take to heart what I just mentioned, uh, you know, just use the best judgment that you can. And if you do have wild stock on your property, it's best to try and keep that going and isolate it as best as possible. Some people are going a step further um, and I've worked with people over the years. Uh, this is a project I was involved with about 18 years ago at this point uh, over in Cambria County. These gentlemen are trying to grow uh, wild ginseng genetics from their forest lands um, and make that seed available to other Pennsylvanians. Uh, and we have a variety of people who are doing that. Uh, the challenge is that oftentimes the seed crops are not that large. And so they only have small amounts of seed to disperse to other growers that are interested. Uh, and, and, you know, that's a big part of the issue of why people turn to these artificial shade produced seed gardens, because they, you know, there's a lot of uh, poundage available at an affordable price. Okay. Many people will grow their own seed beds on the properties. So even if you're not going to grow it in thick beds as a carrot crop, like you see here, this is Larry Harding in Western Maryland. Um, oftentimes they will grow uh, their seed crops in uh, dense arrangements that they can manage and keep and protect and then take the seeds off of those plants and put them out for root production. Okay. And so we get into this business of let's start on one aspect of forest farming, which is you can grow this thing in beds. This is often referred to as kind of a, a woods cultivated or a forest cultivated approach uh, where we're going to essentially convert the understory to ginseng crop. And so this is an example, uh, Larry Harding's crops uh, on his property in, in Friendsville, Maryland area, uh, where he was growing like that. Uh, he has since converted uh, to more of a wild simulated because of a lot of the extreme disease pressure. But it is an interesting concept and it sure is pretty to look at, you know, forest understories of, of plants. Uh, you often get by pushing those plants along with a little bit of soil tillage, maybe a little bit of fertilizer and disease management and so on. You do get a lot more seed production. It is an advantage. Uh, and so you can get more seeds than you would from a, a wild si simulated situation in many cases, which means that you'll have much more seed to plant back for expansion or replacement or for sale to others. Okay. When we think about uh, forest management and forest farming, the first thing we want to think about, though, in our approach is how to manage the forest. So the forest is our, is our you know, farming scenario, if you will. It's our context for the crop that we want to grow. And so as a result, we have to do a little bit of um, education of ourselves about what a forest grows like, right? Like, 
for example, for a succession, what happens in the Eastern United States when for a succession happens? Maybe you don't even know what the word succession means. Succession is simply the change in vegetation over time. Okay, and all vegetation changes. Just pay attention to an abandoned pasture. And very rapidly, it starts to secede to shrubs and the shrubs to trees. And, and the trees that were there at the beginning of the forest are gone later in the forest. That process of succession is typically what we manage in the field of forestry. Okay? And that can be a big hurdle to people's growing ginseng. Uh, this idea of well, what do I do with the trees and how, well, how should I think about the forest above my crop? Because you want to maintain the health of those trees, right? At the very least, but you also want to promote other more desirable species composition. So for example, sugar maple is one of the prime species that ginseng grows under. And there are a variety of reasons for that. But the upshot to that is sugar maple, of course, also yields a sap that we can turn into syrup, which also is a product. And so the, thinking about the composition in that forest overstory and manipulating it can allow us to get a composition that's more favorable to the growth of the crop and provide products that are gonna be of higher quality and healthier in the long run if we just think about it. And so oftentimes people don't know how to begin. And I'll just say that if you're not familiar with this, most states, if not all states that I could think of in the Eastern United States and pretty much in the West as well, have a public service of um, service foresters is what they're typically called. Uh, in Pennsylvania, they are employed by DCNR. And these service foresters are available free of charge to come out and help you assess your forest land and develop a management plan. Many of them are increasingly becoming astute around forest crops like ginseng and are able to factor that into the planning process of the forest. And so while we don't have nearly enough time to talk about all of the forest management principles, this is something that you can learn about through a variety of venues. One of them here at Penn State is called the Forest Stewardship Program, if anybody's interested in that. And they're doing that by Zoom this year. But that's a series of evening and weekend kind of programs that um, are provided to forest landowners that help you understand all aspects of forest, everything from timber sales to how to identify the trees on your property. So you can find that service available at Penn State. So there are a variety of different tools out there for you to kind of learn about your forest land, but you gotta wanna learn about it because forest farming is at its heart about managing the forest to provide the conditions for the understory crops. And that those conditions are going to change over time. Uh, we have now invasive species like emerald ash borer and uh, spotted lanternfly, historically chestnut blight, which have removed entire guilds of species from our forests to begin with. And so this is a constantly evolving process and it needs to be thought through carefully. Um, and, you know, it's one of the things that people can either say, well, this is not for me because I don't want to learn about all that. Or a lot of people think, wow, this is a really interesting rabbit hole. I can spend a lot of time learning about my woods and this is fascinating stuff. I would suggest if you're in that latter category, forest farming is going to be for you. So once we've decided about our forest management plan, uh, then we can get in and start thinking about the understory because we can start thinning trees and we can start making decisions about how we want to grow this. Here's a grower out in Armstrong County uh, who has taken an approach that is a little bit of a hybrid. There's not beds here, but the understory is tilled up and seeded down. And then they take straw and spray the straw on over top of it. Okay. And this is the type of crop that he ends up with. Okay. And that's almost 100% ginseng in there. Okay. Now that's a nice crop. Uh, but you see there's some yellow plants in there and those yellow plants are diseased plants. And so the more you pack those plants in there, the more you're going to be asking for disease problems. In some cases, it's going to be minor disease problems like alternaria blight, but in other cases, it could be Phytophthora, which will kill the plants. 
Okay, here's another section of that forest land owner's uh, property. Uh, you can see a patch of ginseng at the top of the hill on the left side with the may apple. Um, diversifying then the understory to include some of these other botanicals, even if you're not going to harvest them, helps then to reduce the incidence of disease. So in this case, he's allowing for some of these other things like the may apple to grow in with the plants to start to break up some of that uh, monoculture of the ginseng. And it does uh, certainly help improve the conditions. But more than anything, you have to think about the crowding. Um, it's often you know, a situation where we just wanna put a lot of plants in and get as much out as we can. Uh, and so this is a square foot I've got indicated here. We throw down as many seeds as we can. The problem with this approach is that those plants are much too dense. Uh, they're gonna crowd each other out. They're gonna weaken one another. Disease is gonna come in in a wet year, they're gone, okay? And at the very least then, that means that after year three or four, you're gonna to have to get in there. You're gonna to have to thin them out if they're still alive and so on. And that's a lot of labor. So you wanna think about it in a way that you're not trying to crowd the plants because this is what can happen. This is alternaria blight. And alternaria blight actually uh, will just take out the top of the plants and not necessarily kill the root, but losing the top of the plants means that you can lose your berry crop and your seed crop as well, which is not desirable. So keeping the plants thinned out to at most, you can see about four seedlings per square foot, and you're going to want to get that down to at most one seedling per square foot just as a rule of thumb. You don't need to measure this stuff off, but you need to be able to look at an area and say, that's much too thick. I need to thin some of that out. Okay? And when you're planting, you need to kind of not get all crazy and think about putting you know, five seeds in a hole because one might be a dud, right? Because you're gonna have to thin them out or they're gonna die. Okay, and so here's what the seedlings look like coming up. They don't look anything like mature plants. They may stay in that stage for many years. People will try and hasten them by building up beds. This is a woods cultivated kind of scenario where they brought in a lot of rotten old sawdust from an old mill with the idea that they were gonna push the plants and they were gonna push the plants so that they could get more rapid growth, but also that they could get more seeds coming from the plants. These by the way, are locust structures over top with snow fence. And the idea there is basically to keep branches from breaking the plant tops off if they fall off during a thunderstorm so that they don't lose the seed crop. But what these growers found is that they brought in a lot of rot and sawdust. They also got some compost from the local municipality and they thought all that big brown organic matter is gonna do my crop well. And they quickly realized that they brought in a lot of uh, insects in particular. In fact, these little things that we often fish with, right, on the left side, uh, mealworms, we often call them. These things often feed on tubers um, in their, their stage, larval stage, as you can see here. And what they'll often do is drill these holes into uh, the tubers. And essentially, ginseng is a tuber with a little neck or a rhizome on it. And so what they found is they lost a lot of plants because of adding compost to the forest soil. Um, they brought in a lot of unprocessed uh, residue, potato scraps and other types of stuff. It was not a hot compost that was produced. So be very cautious about soil amendments, right? These are wild plants. Um, they're used to growing under wild conditions. The more you give them TLC, um, to some extent better, but you may overkill it and kill is the operative word. Uh, they also found that by creating those nice, loose, loamy conditions, they invited these uh, voles in, okay? And the voles would come in and eat basically the tubers. And there was a feedback loop where the voles are rodents, the rodents are eating the tubers, the tubers have ginsenicides, the ginsenicides increase libido and survival and offspring output, and you get more and more rodents coming into your population. Uh, there's a variety of things that can be done to discourage them, right? You can get these things like mole max, these, these uh, repellents, so to speak, but they're all imperfect and they're expensive and tedious to use in the forest. And you can get non-targets in some of these traps that you don't intend to get. Uh, and so it's just preferable not to, uh, or let's say be very careful about amendments in the soil. 
Oftentimes uh, using amendments, you can create moisture conditions that attract slugs. Slugs are not necessarily a problem for larger plants, but they are a problem for seedlings. They can completely defoliate plants. There are organic methods for uh, controlling slugs, but you wanna be careful to use organic methods. Um, some of the more uh, cheaper and widely available products are quite toxic to other things in the food chain. So for example, uh, if you're killing slugs with these metal aldehyde uh, formulations, oftentimes, you know, if birds are feeding on the slugs, the birds will be poisoned by them. If something feeds on the bird, they'll be poisoned by them. Uh, and so you've got a forest around your crop and there's lots of critters in there. You gotta be careful about using these types of inputs in the forest. Okay, you often have a lot of plant thing, bugs and things that come into the forest and coexist with your crop, which may or may not be a problem. These are jumping plant louse. They often come in and get on the berry heads. And uh, while they don't look like they're much of a problem, they can cause losses of seed. And so just think about this as, as we go through some of these management things that this is not like a litany of everything you're gonna have to deal with. It's just that they're, it's not like it's a, um, a crop that you can just let it go and everything's gonna be hunky-dory. You do have some management challenges and learning to recognize and deal with these things in the most efficient and eco-sensitive way is what it's about. Okay. Uh, these guys are a couple of guys that I work with and they've got some YouTube videos up or we've made some YouTube videos that you can find. Um, I can put some links up at the end of this presentation perhaps you wanna look at them. But they do probably some of the best modeled uh, ginseng production. And so I'm gonna focus uh, much of the rest of my time, we are getting towards you know, over the halfway point here, um, I want to focus my time on what they're doing because I think that they represent a great example of how this can be done successfully and perennially without much problem from disease and so on. Okay, first of all, they think about it as a forest management exercise. And so when they're planting an area, they're always thinking about managing the forest overstory. Uh, one of the gentlemen, Randy, has been a logger for all of his life and he's got some forestry background. And so he knows what kind of trees to keep and you know how to manage, think about managing that forest. And so when he's cutting the timber out of there, he's taking a lot of the biomass and putting that biomass back on the forest floor. In forested ecosystems, all of your nutrient cycling comes from the return of the foliage and that woody biomass back into the soil. And so you don't wanna remove that stuff. You wanna put it down on the forest floor. And furthermore, when you put that kind of tangle down after you've planted there, it's very unattractive for critters to go through there. Deer don't necessarily wanna walk through there. Turkeys don't necessarily wanna go through there. People don't wanna go through there. And the ginseng crop that's in there right now, you can't even make out, right? As you're looking at that, that doesn't even probably occur to you as a ginseng crop. And yet it is every bit as much of a ginseng crop as some of those beds were that I showed you earlier. When these folks then plant these areas, they allow for a desirable mix of early successional vegetation to come up, in this case, blackberries. So we want blackberries, but we don't want, for example, multiflora rose. So they go in annually and they cut out the multiflora rose that's starting to come in. And so you're, you're thinking about what to remove and how to manage that natural succession on your forest land. All the while, the ginseng is growing in and amongst these blackberries. It's growing in and amongst all of the roots, all of the biomass that's laid down on the forest floor. You can even see here's a small multiflora rose down at about five o'clock mixed in there that just cannot get a toehold. And so this is sustainable ginseng production. It mimics what naturally happens in the wild. It may not seem like what we are used to thinking about when we think about farming and cropping, but it is every bit as intentional and as intensive as what we would be doing for planting a garden. We're gonna manage those crops and before too long, they start to reproduce on their own. They start to seed in you can see a variety of different stages that I referenced earlier. Here's a seedling, here's a two-pronger, here's another two-pronger, here's a two-pronger here. This is a good sign. Once those mature plants start to produce seeds and those seeds are planted and they're starting to naturalize, 
Now, instead of that original pound that we put in there, we're starting to grow our population. And that makes it much more of a robust operation that we can revisit each and every year or every other year to harvest from. Those crops then, as they are managed, are co-managed with other desirable species around them. In this case, all of the ginseng, there's about a dozen plants in this visual here, are mixed in with things like blackberries and young ash trees and so on. If, it gets, if the competition gets too dense, we can go in, we can thin that competition out a little bit, cutting it back here and there, but we wanna maintain that diversity. That's gonna keep the plants healthy. That's gonna keep a lot of eyeballs from noticing that we've got $10,000 of ginseng right underneath their nose. Eric? Yes. It's, it's 8.20 by my clock. I'm wondering if we could just ask a couple of the questions that have come up in the chat and then, and then you can keep going. Sure. Um, can you name a few seed suppliers? Uh, I would say in Pennsylvania, you could turn to uh, Colwell's Ginseng. Uh, Denny Colwell out in Armstrong County. He's got a uh, ginseng operation. He sells transplants and seeds. Uh, I showed you a picture of Larry Harding. Uh, you can find Harding's ginseng on the internet. He's down in Friendsville, Maryland. Um, what is the best time of year to identify plants? Uh, typically in May and June. And when do you typically thin out your ginseng? You want to wait until about uh, years three through five until you know what you're dealing with. Okay, that's, that's, that's about the extent of it for now. I just wanted to get those questions in in case there were people who had, a, had sure. to leave at 8.30. Sure. So uh, what you're looking at here is a mature crop of ginseng, uh, just a small area, and there's at least two dozen plants in there, okay? Uh, a lot of plants in there, and yet it may not strike you as a casual observer that that is actually a crop of ginseng. In these types of operations, we still have to deal with little critters. Uh, these things can be jumping plant mice, like you see here, which can feed on the seeds every now and then. Uh, oh, I should have warned you all, trigger warning. Some people have way too many chipmunks on their property and need to dispatch of them on occasion um, because they will not only eat them, but they'll pack them and start, they'll follow you around in the forest sometimes and, and just take them and pack them away for the winter. So, uh, you know, this is issues that we deal with. Some people deal with it by putting cats in the woods. Um, I won't advise that. Uh, a lot of people might be cringing over that and the fate of songbirds. Uh, there's a lot of complexities to that. And there's a lot we could talk about as to how these people are dealing with this to try and keep those cats from feeding on native wildlife and focusing on the rodents. Okay, but they're being trained. Um, so people are being innovative to try and deal with things like rodents, for example, and ginseng patches, because they will expand um, through eating the ginseng uh, in numbers quite quickly. Uh, the ginseng supports their libido. Uh, most of the science is done in laboratories, is done with lab rats, for example. Um, and it of often produces more offspring in rats, for example. And so it probably promotes uh, faster and more rapid growth of rodent populations. And so that can often be, even in these wild simulated successful populations, like I'm walking you through, an issue that some people deal with in creative ways. Okay. Deer can be an issue. Um, they will not kill the plants outright, but they can defoliate, they can eat the berries, they can eat the top of the plants. And if they feed on the plants repetitively, they can kill the plants. Okay. Uh, oftentimes they can be uh, just casual browsers and there's no need to get too bent out of shape uh, when they're just nibbling off a leaf here or there. Uh, but oftentimes it gets to a point where people have to put up deer fence. And so many ginseng growers uh, invest in deer fence. Uh, it doesn't have to be your initial investment. It shouldn't be your initial investment. Usually people wait until they have demonstrated success and there's a reason to put up a fence uh, before they do that because this can be a costly investment. However, this can be paired with um, things to improve timber and the quality of your timber stand. And so there are programs out there that are available for cost share to help fund uh, fencing for deer. So there's a lot of opportunities out there if you are in a high density deer area and you're like, I can't grow ginseng because the deer will eat it. Um, for 
you know, things to be fenced. Uh, a lower cost way to deal with uh, deer is to just pile up brush, as I mentioned earlier, around the plants. Deer are somewhat lazy. Uh, ginseng is not their most preferred browse item. And so oftentimes they'll nibble at other things instead. Here you can see Barry. You can guess in which county of Pennsylvania he might be located. But he's one of those fellows that allows for crops of jewelweed. So this is a crop of ginseng underneath jewelweed. And that jewelweed, in case you're not familiar with what jewelweed in name is, it's that little funny weed that you get oftentimes in wet ditches and areas. But when it grows on forest lands, it often is stunted um, and grows very shallowly as an annual and doesn't compete with the ginseng. And so the ginseng can hide very readily underneath that and the deer love jewelweed. They'll browse the jewelweed while leaving the ginseng all alone in there. So uh, there's different strategies to think about uh, how to deal with deer, everything from fencing to brush piling to uh, intercropping with other more desirable species that aren't gonna be problematic. One of the things I don't advise people do is rely on soil testing. Uh, we're talking about forested conditions and soil testing rarely is useful. Vegetation uh, and vegetative indicators are much more useful and less expensive. Forest soils are heterogeneous. They are produced through a long period of trees falling down and rocks and boulders approaching the surface and all that sort of stuff. And so what that means is that um, it can differ from one place to another quite readily and quite quickly. And when you plant ginseng, you may find that the ginseng grows just fine 15 feet away. It's not doing so well. And so here's an example of that. This is uh, Barry over in Beaver County. And you can see that this is a plant. He couldn't figure out what was going on with it. We took a soil sample from right around the root system. You can see that the pH was a little low and not a lot of calcium and not much else either. And you might say, well, maybe it's just starved. It doesn't have enough nutrition. We went less than one feet away, one foot away to a healthy plant. Here you can see a picture of it. We took another soil sample and you can see there's basically no difference in the soil. So what explains the yellowing of one plant one feet away? I couldn't tell you. And there's a lot of mysteries like that that happen when you grow ginseng in the woods. Okay, turkeys can be a problem this time of year when you're planting the seed out there. So you wanna think about turkeys. They will often come in after you and scratch the seed out, which is what they did at this particular location at Shavers Creek. Um, and so if you've got turkey populations that aren't managed through hunting, you'll just wanna keep that in mind. Okay, again, uh, here's a turkey and here's a craw that someone uh, cleaned out a turkey um, a couple of seasons ago. Uh, colleague of mine up at Cornell. And uh, what he found is a bunch of uh, little caterpillars in there, but also a bunch of turkey seed, or I'm sorry, ginseng seeds in there. Um, and so turkeys will come along and eat your ginseng seeds. And here's an example of that. So here's a bunch of seed heads that came out of the craw of a turkey. So yes, these are wild critters. They're native critters. Um, we like to look at them and hunt them and all those sorts of things, photograph them in some cases, but when you're trying to grow a crop, um, you know, you're competing with them in some cases for things. And so you have to think about how you're going to manage a lot of these forest land critters. Um, and it's not guaranteed that there'll be a problem, but you do have to give it some thought. Last thing I'm going to end with, and I don't want to end on a bad note, but it is something to think about. Um, the major problem out of all of these critters that people have is with the human critter. Uh, ginseng is of high value, as you're aware. In many parts of Appalachia, there's a culture around harvesting ginseng. And that culture prides itself on being outlaws and not listening to regulations and laws and uh, not paying attention to property boundaries. Um, whatever you, know, you think about that kind of culture, uh, the reality is, is that a lot of people that spend a lot of money, a lot of effort, a lot of blood, sweat, and tears to put ginseng out on their property, have it wiped out because they've got neighbors that won't leave it alone. Uh, so you do have to think about where you are in the state, where you're thinking about planting, how much can you keep an eye on it? Uh, do you have ginseng hunters that you know are neighbors? Are, are you friendly with them? Can you have that conversation with them and tell them 
I'm growing ginseng on my property. I don't want you on there digging it, but I'd be happy if you were to keep an eye on it for me, right? That sort of thing. And develop those kinds of, um, you know, boundaries and agreements. And these things happen, you know, I'll, I've visited a lot of uh, communities over the years where people have talked to me uh, after a workshop about how they've come up with agreements with one another or with neighbors about their ginseng and how to keep an eye on it and so on. So, you know, people aren't all bad, but you do have some bad apples out there and the bad apples can ruin it, especially when it comes to ginseng. And so, you know, I work with law enforcement, trying to educate law enforcement about this issue. Uh, here's a picture that was taken at a ginseng workshop we did with PASA a few years ago. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm not a snitch per se, but I definitely uh, it, try and support landowners and landowner protection of their crop, uh, whether it's a wild crop or a wild simulated crop. Everybody has got a right to invest their time in their own property and get rewards from it without having things stolen from them, right? Um, and so oftentimes people argue that poaching is not a hard enough term when we talk about this issue, that it really is just about theft. People are stealing your crop from you. And once we start talking about it in that light, then it becomes recognized as a much more serious concern. So one of the bigger things that people deal with in growing ginseng is this issue of neighbors, ginseng hunters uh, that come onto their property, find their ginseng and won't leave it alone. Uh, some of the people that have developed businesses and have websites become a target um, through their website for ginseng thieves. And so it's just something you wanna think about in terms of where you locate your ginseng farm or your ginseng patch um, and what your neighbors are like and how far back in the woods you're gonna stick it and all that sort of stuff. Because there's no cavalry that's gonna come running. And I don't want to get too much into the weeds around policy, but, you know, land ownership in Pennsylvania and the people who enforce uh, things like ginseng laws in the state of Pennsylvania is very complicated. There's no 1-800 number that you can call that the ginseng police are going to come out and back you up. Uh, it's one of the major issues that ginseng growers have is that when, you know, they do catch thieves, oftentimes the police don't come. So it's a challenge uh, and all I can say is that it's something that's growing in awareness as forest farming is growing as a land use option and ginseng as a crop and different states are starting to take a fresh look at what needs to be done to protect ginseng growers interests. Because it does get bad. Um, people can get shot over this. This is a case from Ohio a few years ago. Uh, it's only gotten worse in recent years because of television shows that kind of glorify. This was on the History Channel. This one here is on National Geographic of all places, okay? But shows about how to steal people's ginseng have kind of make it a, a, you know, made it a little bit of a fun and games kind of thing for, for certain aspects of the American culture. Okay. But it's not a new issue and people have had to deal with it for a long time. Uh, this is from 1892. Uh, and people have had to just, again, give some good thought to where they're locating their gardens and of trying to get their neighbors to, if you're on good terms, to be eyes and ears for you and all that sort of stuff. Um, and just think about carefully where you want to locate things, most of all. Okay. Or you can buy some uh, English bloodhounds. Okay, so final couple things I'll mention that aren't a little bit humorous is that one of the things that law enforcement tells us, and I hate to go here because I grew up in Western Pennsylvania, running freely in the woods, not barefoot though, um, on many properties because people didn't post their properties. Uh, but what law enforcement tells us and tells ginseng growers is that you gotta post your property if you're calling it a farm and you don't want people digging your ginseng. And the reason they say that is it's a more clear uh, breaking of a felony law because it's crop destruction at that point, right? If someone comes on your property, it's posted, they know it's your property and they're in there digging your crop, it becomes an ag law that's on the books and it's considered a felony in the state of Pennsylvania, not just a misdemeanor. So you wanna think about posting, you wanna think about um, the approach that you wanna to take to telling your neighbors about this or you know, signing your patch. 
Um, this is a sign that was put up on a research site in Cornell, um, and it's a bluff. Um, and you might guess that it's a bluff, uh, but in many cases, people these days are not bluffing and they're using cameras. Uh, and cameras are an effective tool to see who's out there wandering around your patch and when, uh, and oftentimes can settle things right there because you'll be like, oh, that's my neighbor. I guess I got to go have a conversation with them. Okay. And so, uh, you know, cameras, deer cameras and things like that are being uh, rapidly used. If you have a cell phone signal, you can even get a, a card that will take a live picture and send it to your cell phone or send you an email so that you can run out there uh, a minute after that picture is taken rather than having to go and download off of the camera. So the technology is good these days um, and it's extremely helpful. Uh, just about every grower that I know that's serious about ginseng uh, has multiple cameras lined up in their woods. Okay. And you can get some pretty crisp pictures. Here's a ginseng plant and here's a dude standing there in a Metallica shirt drinks, drinking a PBR. <laughs> Eyeing up the ginseng, in this case, uh, with no ill intent, just curious. Okay. But uh, the final slide I'll end on is to say, the reason that you may not have heard about any of this, and this might all or some of it might be new to you, is because most ginseng and most ginseng cult cultivation in the state of Pennsylvania is kept secret. Most people don't want to talk about it because they realize the most secure thing for them to do is to keep it to themselves with few exceptions. Maybe you've got a good hunting buddy or, or something like that, you know, that you can trust. But for the most part, you have to think about who can be trusted um, and who do you wanna give away. Uh, and so that's a big part of the ginseng uh, situation right now where most people who are successfully cultivating this and are doing it without a problem from thieves are doing it completely on the, the radar. Uh, they're generally not calling it forest farming. And that's the bulk of where much of the ginseng comes from in the Eastern United States. And so if we circle back to the beginning of the presentation, uh, what's being sold as wild ginseng out of the Eastern United States into China is increasingly uh, being replaced with what we would call wild simulated ginseng. But there's no mechanism really in place to track that. So people are intimately engaged with this plant at this point in history. While there is some wild collection and hunting going on out there, uh, there's a, a very rapid growth and in interest in people cultivating it. And as a result, um, as I mentioned, we have a variety of extension resources on my website. Uh, you'll find a variety of different people who sell seed and planting stock out there. And uh, on that note, I'm gonna end it and say, thank you for paying attention. And if you have any questions, I'd be glad to stick around and answer a few. Great. Thank you so much, Eric, for that generous presentation. We do have a couple questions in the chat. And if anybody hanging on has questions to add, please do. Uh, pretty much everybody is hung on. So um, the first one from Chabam, uh, when do you typically thin out your ginseng? Uh, I think you mentioned that one earlier, but uh, basically we're looking at three to five years typically is when we can start to get a sense of how thick it is. And how much might start to survive. Um, yeah. First or second year, uh, just to add on to that just quickly, the first or second year when the seedlings come up, almost always, unless you did something really bad or you bought some really bum seed, it's gonna look pretty good. You're gonna get seedlings coming up, it's gonna look pretty good. So you really wanna wait until you get into that three to five year time frame before you start to assess, wow, I got a lot of plants here still, I better start thinning them around. Uh, and then the same person followed up. What time of year do you thin out after three to five? Years? Typically, you're uh, gonna. It's gonna be dependent on where you are in the region, uh, assuming you are in this region, uh, because we've got a lot of different climate zones, right? And so ginseng can die back depending on where you are. Like sometimes in Lancaster County, for example, berries are mature in early July, and it may be gone by early August. Uh, this year in local patches here in central Pennsylvania, we had plants up till just a couple of weeks ago. So it really just depends on how, where you're at and how long the plants will stay up. And just after a couple of years, you can generally start to notice that. But you're going to want to move them before they completely senesce and die back. But you want to wait late enough in the season that they've already had a chance 
to do some growing and store some carbohydrates in the root system. Is there a market for foliage? And if there is, is it worth the cost to the plant to harvest that foliage? That's a great question. Um, that is actually a very uh, exciting area of work that we've been working on since 2014 with growers here in Pennsylvania, including the two that I showed you the picture of, uh, Rick, Randy and Cliff. I don't think I mentioned their names, but uh, the two gentlemen featured in YouTube. Uh, we've been looking at some of the early scientific literature, uh, early meaning there's not a whole lot known on what's in the foliage, but um, the early studies from this investigation topic indicate that there are a whole nother array of ginsenicides potentially present in the foliage during the growing season. And so we've been working with these growers to, to look at that market and develop it domestically. And it's been growing year in and year out, um, such that the growers that are currently in our forest grown program and sell to some of the companies that are buying this leaf, they can't supply enough right now. Yeah. Um, furthermore, uh, we just, I just was working all day on a research proposal that's going in on Friday, uh, where we're gonna partner with those growers to look more carefully at some of the phytochemistry in the foliage that is what types of ginsenicides are in there during the growing season, given the har harvest timing. And also then what's the bioavailability or what kind of effect does that have on cancer cell lines, for example. And then the second part to your question is, is there a trade-off to uh, growing the root? There can be, and that's part of that study as well. We're gonna look at the timing of the foliage harvest and the quantity of the foliage harvest. The gentlemen that are currently harvesting for market typically only take one one prong off of a three prong plant. That's all they'll take. So they retain at least two thirds of the leaves when they harvest. That has not shown any detriment in the last seven years in their operation, but we need to look a little more carefully at that. Great. Uh, what effects of climate warming are you seeing, if any, on growing ginseng? Um, it's early. The, there's a couple of ways that that could manifest. Uh, the most immediate one is that, of course, the temperatures continue to rise and people aren't aware of that. It's, you know, may seem like we're having super cold winters and super hot, dry summers like we had this, this year, but year after year, the temperatures keep rising on average. So it, it's definitely changing. And uh, if nothing happens, it's gonna to continue to change. What's gonna happen under those conditions then is that many of the tree species uh, the co-occur with ginseng are going to shift north. And so we don't see a whole lot of impact, um, maybe with sugar maple shifting a little bit more north, that being a major tree species associated with ginseng, that could have some impact in terms of which land uh, people can manage sugar maple for, which in other words, is gonna have ramifications for which land you can manage ginseng for. But the more immediate thing is um, when we don't have like last winter, uh, we didn't have really any snowpack here in central Pennsylvania at all. And ginseng seed, when you're seeding at this time of year, can endure a certain amount of freezing uh, when it's underneath the leaf litter layer. But we also count on that snow as being an insulating factor as well to protect it from predation, as well as from severe cold temperatures. And so as we start to see uh, warming without as much snow during winter, that may very well impact um, how much seed is predated and how much the seed is, is uh, able to remain viable over time. Um, thanks for that answer. Um, Bethany asks, how do you deal with stilt grass? That's a great question. Invasive species are, invasive plants are a major issue on forest lands right now. Um, again, most people don't pay attention to it. Uh, but this has been a phenomenon that's been going on for uh, a couple of hundred years, and it's uh, almost reaching a fever pitch in parts of the states. So if you're in southeastern Pennsylvania, you probably know what I'm talking about. Many natural areas down there uh, are largely invaded with non-native invasive vegetation. Uh, so it becomes very daunting how to compete with some of that stuff. In the case of Japanese stillgrass, stillgrass is one of those frustrating plants because if you're not familiar with it, it's an annual uh, and it produces very shallow roots. And so you can tug it out very, very easily. It's one of the easiest invasive plants to manage. 
just reach down, grab it by the, the blades and pull it out and it comes right out. But the challenge is, is it produces a ton of seed. When that seed gets into an area and those seedlings start to germinate, and come up through other plants, uh, they can go like wildfire throughout an area. And it's very difficult to keep up with it and to use anything except for hand weeding to get it out of all of those desirable plants that you don't necessarily want to kill with an herbicide, for example. And so it's a very frustrating plant to actually have to deal with. The best thing that I can suggest is we do know that silk grass, while it grows on forest lands, uh, it definitely is less vigorous, the more shade that is over top of it. Um, and so trying to manage those openings that happen or those edge situations first and foremost to prevent the silk grass and other invasive species from coming in through those little cracks that open is a very important strategy. Uh, don't let it get started in the first place. And where they're gonna get started is where you get some of those gaps in the canopy and get a little more sunlight coming down. That's where the seeds start to germinate that the birds or whatever have moved in. Uh, and that's where we start to see it move from. And uh, a final part to that question is that still grass is in some ways not the worst one that we're dealing with uh, because by and large on our sites where we're growing, ginseng and we have still grass, uh, it doesn't seem to be too impacted. Now, you know, these are not long-term studies, but it doesn't seem to be too impacted by virtue of the fact that the still grass doesn't really start to develop any biomass until late summer. And at that point, ginseng in many areas has either died back or is on its way to dying back. So there's a little bit of a, a break that ginseng gets just by virtue of its morpho or its phenology. Um, so there's not that direct competition oftentimes that we see with uh, still grass and other plants that bloom and reproduce in late summer. Hey, uh, um, definitely an easy invasive to remove, but also an incredibly successful invasive. Yeah. Um, Jesse asks, I am going to do research on aquaponic growth on, of ginseng mm -hmm. and how it affects ginsenicide concentrations. Do you have any opinions on how this may turn out? I have none. I saw that in your in the chat. Um, we are uh, just starting to do a lot of ginsenicide research ourselves here with partners in Tennessee. And uh, we're not looking at aquaponics at all. Um, I have no idea what that might do to ginsenicides. Um, curious, stay in touch. See what, <laughs> let me know what you come up with. Um, does anybody else have a, a question they'd like to throw out there before we say good night? Um, please enter it now. Eric, I thank you so much for, uh, uh, for this presentation and for the work you're doing to advance agroforestry practices and forest farmed crops in the state and beyond. I don't see any other questions. Uh, folks, I'd uh, ask you to fill out the evaluation in the chat box, linked in the chat box. Um, otherwise, uh, thank you very much for joining tonight. And Eric, thank you for the presentation. Sure. Thanks, everyone. I hope you learned something. Like I said, we, uh, we could spend a lot of time talking about ginseng and, and different aspects of ginseng cultivation. So hopefully you got a little more insight than you had before. And feel free again to download some of the extension pubs and so on. Uh, to fill in some of the gaps.